to this week's office hours for ESG and ESG CV. My name is Shavana McCaleb and I am today's moderator. If you are just joining us, please go to the chat and introduce yourself with your name and the region you represent. As a reminder, this office hour session is being recorded for public record. A copy of the slide deck and recording will be emailed to all attendees. Next slide, please. How to ask a question. All questions must be submitted in the chat box. Please type your organization and question into the chat box. The team will read questions out loud at the end of the presentation, and we will provide answers, if possible, throughout the presentation. All questions and answers entered into the chat box will be recorded as part of the public record. Next slide. Today's office hour session agenda includes the following. ESG and ESG CV updates, office hours updates, upcoming training, ESG and ESG CV Q&A, spotlight series presentation, shared housing. Next slide, please. ESG policy documents. All of the resources on this tab will be included in the slide deck when emailed. Next slide, please. Here we have your ESG team representatives. This will also be included in the slide deck. Next slide, please. Upcoming office hours topics on 1026, youth homelessness. On 11.2, written standards and policy and procedures review expectations. On 11.9, ESG grant sunset. On 11.16, ESG and ESG CV contract amendment process. We also have listed at the bottom the training site to register for office hours and the link for previous office hours recordings. Next slide. Upcoming trainings for October, October the 20th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Casement, 11.30 a.m. Case Management Best Practices, Rapid Rehousing, Community Workshop Series. This session will discuss housing-focused case management for individuals and families being serve, served under rapid rehousing projects. October the 20th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Othering. This is part of the racial equity series. This session will work to uncover the dangers of othering, the practice of laboring, labeling some groups as not fitting in with culture and social norms based on group characteristics, and learn to recognize and avoid patterns of exclusion and marginalization caused by othering. On October the 27th, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., calling in, calling out, this is part of the racial equity series. This workshop will teach participants the difference between calling in and calling out. Two very different ways of bringing prejudice to light and the factors that determine which way could be better in different situations. We also have at the bottom of this link, the um, link to um, register. Next slide, please. Here are your covert response resources. These will also be included in the slide deck. Next slide. These are your monkeypox resources. This, these will also be included. Next slide, please. And lastly, we have ESG resource links. These links will also be included in the slide decks. Next slide, please. Questions. Okay, I believe there are no questions. So we will go to the next slide, please. How to contact us if you have further questions. You may for annual ESG, please reach out to your ESG um, representative or email ESGNOFA at hcd.ca.gov. For ESG CV, please reach out to your grant administrator. Next slide. 
And now I will hand it over to Erica for the Spotlight Series presentation. Great. Thanks, everyone. Good to be with you this morning. My name is Erica Snyder. I am working with ICF on this contract. You may have seen me in the past on a couple other Spotlight Series or through other trainings, but today we are going to dive into shared housing. Next slide, please. So before I get into like the nitty gritty uh, or as nitty gritty as I can in like 20 minutes on shared housing, I wanted to kind of paint the picture as why we're even talking about it. Um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition puts out a report every year that some of you may already be familiar with called Out of Reach, where they look at what are the costs in the state in terms of housing and then how does that cross back to wages and how affordable is it really for folks when we compare not just housing costs, but what they're making to be able to, to live in housing. And what you see in front of you are based off of last year and it's for the total state. So factor in that there, there are some markets in California that are really high, some that are still high, but not quite as high. And so when we look at our state minimum wage, um, overall that average rent, renter wage that we need to see is almost $25 an hour. And we know and recognize that a lot of the folks that we're working with aren't receiving that high of a wage necessarily. But if you they want to live in a two bedroom, it goes up a bit. And while we're working with a very vulnerable subpopulation, overall, there's almost 6 million people who are renting, and that's almost half the state. So there's a lot of competition for that limited housing stock. You'll see on here, what it breaks down is what's that affordable uh, wage that they need. And when I say affordable, the goal and what that means is that they're paying no more than 30% of their income towards rent and utilities. I actually just saw a report yesterday that showed nationwide, most people are paying 52% towards their housing costs, which is, uh, which would be definitely considered cost burdened. Um, but when we look at these wages, then below the fair market rent, and this is again from 2021, and, and overall for the state, not specific markets, a one bedroom is $1,600 or more on average. And when we're looking at two bedrooms, that's 2000, that starts adding up. And we, as a community, knowing that housing isn't gonna be built as quickly as it needs to be for the folks who are experiencing um, homelessness right now, it kind of op opens up opportunities for us to be creative and how we get people housed. Next slide, please. And so we're talking about shared housing. And really that is our way of saying um, housemates, roommates, living with somebody who is uh, either you are not related to or you are related to, but you're sharing living expenses. We know that over 30% of adults are living with someone. And I would say, I ask if you have a roommate or a housemate. And when I say that, it means, if you have a partner or you're married or have a significant other and you're living with them, you technically have a roommate. If you are living with other family members, perhaps you're living with parents, uncles, aunts, cousins, that's a roommate. If you have children and they're living in your home, technically that's a roommate. We're sharing housing. Um, now they may not all be contributing towards rents and utilities, but it's a really common practice that people do all the time, um, either out of necessity or just desire for community. And so there's no reason to assume that just because someone is currently unhoused, that they wouldn't flourish and thrive with having somebody to share housing with. Next slide. So when we talk about it in our particular field about shared housing, there's two models that most folks talk about. There's that model that I think a lot of us are familiar with, where it's two or more people want to live together or want to live in a particular neighborhood. And so they share the house, that model, um, the roommate situation. And then there's also home sharing, which is often when there's a homeowner who's looking to rent out a room and share space in their house. And this model we've seen actually happening in a lot of places um, take off in terms of like host homes. So with um, unaccompanied youth or transition age youth who are renting out a room in someone's home, that that can be helpful. Also, we see that with um, some of our aging populations who own a home, but want somebody else in the house with them for community, for companionship, or just to help. Like when you're on a fixed income, renting out a room can make it a lot more viable to stay where you're living. And so that is an option. I would also say within that, keep in mind that for ESG CV, we're allowed to do subleases. And so that does open up a lot of opportunities within home sharing, where someone could sublease out or sublet out a portion 
of their home to someone that you're working with, and that is a permanent housing option. Next slide, please. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to focus on rapid rehousing because that's the eligible activity that we have access to within ESG CD. Um, but things to keep in mind when we're talking about HUD funded programs for rapid rehousing, if you're going to do a roommate housing or what have you, everybody that is the assisted household needs to have a lease. Um, and on that lease needs to call out their portion of the rent based off of the space that they're using in the house, their private space. So if that's a room and a bathroom, maybe they have a room and a shared bathroom that gets called out um, in relation to the other tenants. So it's just that percentage. And then the overall size of the unit is dictated by the co-housing tenants, preferences, income, other things that are going on within there. And then um, no, this gets a little tricky. So if you're dipping your toe in the water of shared housing, I would encourage you to first start with like two roommates or three, what have you, where everyone has their own room. It is possible though, depending on the funding sources and when folks agree that they could do a shared room. Um, and keep in mind, like you'll hear me say this, like this is permanent rental housing. This ends someone's homelessness. This resolves some of their housing crises. So if the participant has their own lease, they also have full tenancy rights and all the protections therein. And so this is a very viable option for some households. And it might just take us having some housing problem conversations, which we talked about recently, to even identify like who's a good fit for you to live with. Next slide, please. So pros and cons, what works well, what are benefits and challenges in shared housing? I think one of the big benefits is it makes rent attainable for more folks. When we were looking at the first slide, a one bedroom at $1,600 a month can really push the budget. But if you're splitting a two bedroom at $2,000 a month, so maybe it's a thousand, maybe it's one household place a little bit more because they have the larger room, that suddenly can be something that folks may be able to afford. Um, it also can give you wider housing options because there's limited numbers of studios and one bedrooms, but we have more two, three, fours, perhaps in different parts of where you live. And so this could open up different zip codes and different areas for folks to live together. If you are also operating a landlord incentive program with ESG CV, depending on how you structure it, but a lot of folks structured that a landlord gets a signing bonus per lease. That's a great incentive because if they have to, if there's two folks living in a two bedroom and they sign two leases, technically that's two incentives available to them. Um, there's also access to that risk mitigation fund if they have concerns, but those are all things that can incentivize landlords to be willing to rent to multiple folks who are unrelated. Um, and also just know that I think a lot of landlords are more comfortable or more familiar with this because it's not an abnormal model, it's not brand new. I would also just say that you'll see there's some things on here for benefits for the folks that you're housing in terms of providing support, um, helping folks to not feel isolated or alone. People are designed to live in community and people who are currently unhoused have a community. And so sometimes we see, and I'm sure some of you could even pop stories in the chat of once someone's been housed, how they can really have challenges now that and feel isolated that they are on their own. Yes, housing is good, but Perhaps they're feeling like there's parts of their community that they're no longer having access to. Shared housing or having a housemate resolves that. Um, they can have someone for encouragement and support, but also just like when you live with folks, you kind of help each other out. So it could help in terms of cooking or maybe even childcare. It can help with transportation. Maybe there's someone who likes to cook and someone who's willing to do the dishes. And so they could swap and work together on things and lessen that load of trying to maintain your own home on your own. Uh, and then also safe housing, that this can open that door and they could have another person in the home who could really, you know, you hear that bump in the night and you're like, oh, well, there's someone else here. I feel a little better. When we talk though about challenges, cause that's real and that is a part of this. I think the first one that comes to mind for me are just in general, living with people means you're living with another human being and factoring in their preferences, their desires, how they communicate with you. It's really things that can like small things can become aggravating and they can add up. 
And some of this is mediation skills or being able to communicate and having expectations and then finding ways to effectively reinforce positive things. But those interpersonal challenges pop up for sure. And sometimes it may require a higher degree of case management to mediate that. Um, so to be willing to talk to roommates to help them think through that, maybe it's even finding like the right language for it. it could be they got triggered by something and they can't figure out why they were so mad that their roommate let the dishes soak for like two days. And it's like, all right, well, let's figure out how you can talk with them about that. Um, and so that that does take a little bit of work, but it's not insurmountable. Also requiring separate leases, depending on the landlord, that could just take a little bit of creative um, messaging to them. And those incentives, if you have those can help. If you don't have landlord incentives, I think it's really painting the picture for what that means. And ultimately, this also addresses the next question about landlords who might feel like a little concerned about renting to multiple unrelated adults, let's say they're friends in this instance, those separate leases actually give a lot of protections back to the landlord. Because let's say there's a three bedroom, there's three roommates live in there. One tenant isn't a good fit. They're having issues with other, let's say they're having issues with other uh, roommates or their income's changed, they can't afford it. That allows them to move out um, and a new person to move into that room because they have their own lease and it, it keeps everything else stabilized. And so there's a lot of flexibility in keeping that going. And also if the person's not a good fit, the landlord has all the protections of the law because it's an individual lease and it doesn't cause instability for the other households necessarily. I would say another challenge, uh, just things to think about when we plan our program models, case management isn't always designed to stay engaged after rental assistance ends or it looks different in housing stability versus housing search. And so making sure that those supports are available to folks to talk through that is really big. And part of that too is knowing that, let's say you have folks, two folks in a rapid rehousing program who choose to live together. One gets more rental assistance than the other due to a lot of things, but that's what progressive engagement is designed to do. Their roommates, they may share that information and that might cause questions of like, hey, why does Joe get this and I don't? Why does this happen? And so maintaining privacy becomes something that you've got to navigate as well as um, making sure folks understand about how they're being assisted based off of their own unique needs and it's not a one size fits all program. And that gets also lastly into, there's just more nuanced landlord tenancy supports. You might have landlords who reach out more for mediation purposes where there are different questions. I think that happens overall, but when you have those separate folks coming together, it just could open the door for other opportunities for conversation there. Next slide. Uh, you heard me talk about home sharing. That's when there's a homeowner who is subleasing or subletting out a portion of their home. This can match individuals, like I mentioned, um, to homeowners, to tenants who could be a good fit. And you might see public postings in different places where people are renting out their room or subletting that out. Um, most of these strategies are going to be targeted to folks who are looking to supplement their mortgage or their rent with somebody who's uh, provide that stable income coming through. And they're looking for a house meet that also can match the way that they're choosing to live their lives as well. And so there are different programs. I know some throughout California, um, you might even have some nonprofit partners in your continuum of care who are working specifically with homeowners to find those matches. And they might not all be homeless services focused. They might be, perhaps their uh, focus is a bit larger towards low income or moderate income folks, but they have opportunities to screen folks in with those roommates. And that it can also be a strategy that if you, you know of folks within your community who are trying to rent out specific bedrooms that you could utilize in your own program. Next slide, please. And then roommate matching, um, there are some different resources on roommate matching that can come out there. And I'm gonna put the two links that are on the slide in the chat for you right now, just in case you wanted to see those. But this is pretty much, let's like, as a part of your housing problem solving conversations, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, if you ask folks like, are you, you wanna live in this area, rents keep going up or rents are a little bit higher, would you be willing to consider living with someone to like share those costs, whatever those conversations unfold? 
Um, and perhaps you have other folks in your program, or if you're doing something wider throughout coordinated entry and a by name list, maybe there are other folks in general across agencies who are looking for housing. It's really creating space for them to decide if they want to live together. And that can be, um, there are some different roommate questionnaires, like finding out like, hey, I don't do mornings and I work nights and I need it quiet in the morning, or I am allergic to cats, or I need an ADA unit, like fill in the blank for getting into some of those questions there. Um, and so that way they can get ideally paired to someone who looks to be compatible and then creating also those space for them to meet together and have conversations and they ultimately decide if it's the right fit for them. Um, this, if you're doing it across agencies, it can make for a higher level of follow up, especially when you're doing housing leads and applying for units and just making sure everyone's processing things as quickly. And then after the fact that like, if there are ever tensions that the case managers are talking with each other and talking directly um, with the tenants, but it can be a huge benefit and open up a lot of opportunities. And I would also say, um, we can move to the next slide, please that within this, it's really important to keep in mind that we don't necessarily have to do all of it for folks. We're in this business to empower people to find solutions, um, to help them identify what's gonna work for them. They might already have relationships with friends, with family, coworkers, who they wanna live with. And some of those folks maybe are currently housed and looking to live somewhere else. Just because someone is an unhoused doesn't mean that they're not a viable option for a roommate. And so, like creating space for folks to make those connections, but in instances where your program wants to help facilitate that, kind of outline some of the steps, which I talked about on the previous slide, but looking at based off of uh, folks' potential wishes for a roommate who could be compatible, creating opportunity for them to connect. Maybe they meet at a coffee shop, maybe they meet at someone's office, what have you, where they can talk. Um, you can even like, if you want, coach them and hear like, here's some questions you might want to ask, because based off what I know of you, and what we've talked about, this is what's important to you. Um, and then if they decide that they do want to move in together, it can be really helpful to have a roommate agreement. And maybe some of you are thinking like, Erica, I, I've had a roommate in the past, and we didn't have a roommate agreement. That's all right. But this could be things too that outlines kind of what they expect for each other, or maybe when it comes to sharing a refrigerator, someone gets the top shelf and someone gets the middle shelf. Maybe we can outline, do you wanna be in charge of your own paper products like toilet paper and paper towels? Or are we gonna like share that as a, a household? How do we wanna handle utilities? Uh, how do we wanna handle if someone starts dating someone and their significant other becomes like, feeling like a third roommate? Like what, are, what do we do there? So you can navigate some of those sticky situations early on and have them agree to that. And then if those things don't go according to plan, it gives them something to go back to, to say like, does this still work for us? What, what makes sense? Uh, and there are some different templates out there too for roommates agreements, or it could also just be something really informal. And it could be like, we agree, like we're gonna talk to each other when we get frustrated. Uh, you could decide how that gets structured and they can decide what works for them. Next slide, please. There are different uh, staffing positions that can help be a part of shared housing. You can even have your own shared housing coordinator if that is available to you within your budget, who's a part of case man the case management team and housing location. But here are just some different roles that maybe you have right now that could add this in as a housing option, um, a housing solution for folks. So if you have someone in your community who's doing that housing navigation or location piece, whatever title that you're using, they could screen in that place for potential matches. It could get asked if that's something they're interested in and then follow up with the clients as they go through that matching process. If you have folks that are directly looking and working with landlords that are dedicated towards that as a housing li liaison, they can specifically, when they're looking at multi-bedroom units, kind of uh, pave the way for a shared housing conversation to see if the landlords would be willing to do separate leases. Maybe even in some instances, would the would landlords be willing to roll in utilities? So then it's one cost and the roommates don't have to worry about um, figuring out whose bills and what's named. They just each pay their share each month. And that landlord liaison could also highlight some of the features and things that we talked about early on, like here are the benefits to you as a property owner or property manager in these types of situations. And then of course your case managers, or if there's someone who's doing peer supports are available 
just not only to talk with folks about their housing options, but to present this as an opportunity to create space for them to identify folks in their own network that might already work as a potential roommate, or like where could they go to look at your community if they wanted a roommate, um, and all, things to think about once they're housed. And ultimately, once someone is housed, your housing stabilization team, and, and this may very well be a case manager who's doing all of these things. Um, but if there's somebody who's working with folks after their house can provide um, that space to say like, what are things to do to make this successful? How can having a roommate now fit in with your long-term other housing goals? Like maybe they do want to live alone at some point, but they need a roommate for a year. So helping folks stay focused on what that would be. Next slide, please. This is a little of the semantics of how you can pay for it with HUD funding specifically or whether or not it's even allowable. So you'll see uh, that the rules and regs do call out for housing choice vouchers. So these are your section eights and other programs that come through um, your public housing authorities that it is allowable within there. It's also allowable if a community partner is receiving HOPWA or housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. Like they specifically call that out there and they call it out as it relates to community development block grant where there's areas with rental assistance and other items. Um, the rules are silent, meaning they don't bring it up. They don't say yes. They don't say no. So we take it as a yes on within emergency solutions grants funding, both your annual funds as well as the CV funds within your continuum care programs and within the home program where there's tenant based rental assistance. The one hard and fast no that we could say is if your community has project-based vouchers, that shared housing is not allowable there because it's tied to the unit and there's other things involved in that process. Next slide, please. So since we all on this call are involved in ESG, I wanted to call out some specific ESG things that you could think about. You heard me mention that the interim rule is silent on that, on shared housing, which allows us to do roommate housing. Um, you could do this within rapid rehousing or homelessness prevention for the eligible households. And the units still have to meet habitability. All those things apply. What you would do with a regular lease, you're just pairing multiple folks together in a multi-bedroom unit. And um, really, this supports our overall goals for stability and other things to move them into a situation that will ideally be stable. Uh, what I wanted to, let me see if I could find it quickly. There was, there's been an AAQ on shared housing. I'm going to put it in the chat here, but you'll also see on this slide some of the rules and regs that support that. There are some folks who like to make sure they have all that information before they go forward. This gives you some of that information on the funding source. Next slide, please. And then as a reminder too, this falls in because it's ESG funded, there's gonna be a few different tenancy agreements. There's gonna be four. One, there's gonna be a lease that has the tenant's name and the landlord and the rental info, like costs, that information, which you're already doing. Um, we would recommend that you add in a roommate agreement. I should say, I would recommend that you add in a roommate agreement that gives that shared language that folks can navigate and understand like, what are we getting into together? And then there should be that agreement between either your organization or whatever entity provides that rental assistance with the landlord. That's already a part of your rapid rehousing program or your homelessness prevention programs. And then also like an agreement between whatever entity covers the rent or your agency um, with the tenant directly of understanding kind of how the rent's gonna be determined, what your model looks like. And just keep in mind, we're mainly talking about HUD funding, but most public funding sources are going to require separate leases, that the lease is in someone's name and it's connected back. Because again, that affords them all of the tenancy rights and doesn't cause housing instability if one like placement doesn't work out for one person, but it does for the other housemates. Next slide, please. There is a lot of different questions you might be wondering, like, how do I figure out rent? What does this look like? What does that look like? There is a training that is available for you all to look at. I believe this is just the slide deck that I put in the chat that goes over the HUD rules and regs and starts moving and talking in that direction. Um, I also put in links earlier to the Shared Housing Institute. I believe they have a recording of that training on their website if you wanted to watch that. Um, so that is available. I would also say, there was um, the SNAPS office does 
office hours regularly. And they did one in May, I put the link in here, where they had a group out of Florida who's doing shared housing. And they talked about how that worked, not only with their programs, but also with coordinated entry and other things. And then at the end, um, HUD kind of did like a live AAQ with their experts on continuum of care funding and ESG funding to say, how do we make this work with HUD dollars? And so if you catch up or want to look at that particular uh, office hours, it starts answering some of the frequent questions that we hear when folks are trying to figure out the mechanics of how to make the funding match the program model. Um, so with that, I think my last slide is just kind of open for questions or thoughts. I, I would also love to hear if there are folks on the line who are doing roommate or shared housing or home sharing, like how that's going for you, and if you have any lessons learned to share with your peers. Erica, we do have one question as of right now from Ernesto Coronado Fernandez. And he's asking, how do we distribute this information to those with home insecurity or are homeless? Sure. So if you're if you are working, Ernesto or and others like directly with clients, like you could start talking with them directly about having roommates. And I would say make it in a language that's accessible and understandable. I think um, shared housing might make sense to all of us, but what, like, how do we talk about it normally <laughs> and use that? Like, you're not going to see that in like a news article, or I think my threshold is like, if I split down with my grandmother, is she going to understand this? Cause she's not in my world and if grandma doesn't understand it. I need to work on the language. Um, so you could do that there. And with other partners, if you have other agencies in your community who are willing to do shared housing, talk with them about like, how do we get this communication channel out to um, the folks that we're working with? If you are a street outreach team, I think this is a great opportunity to connect it back to that housing problem solving and say like, you know, you're living in a community here, like you've got friends who are living with you, would you all be willing to live together in a home if we could find you one? Those are things where it, it's just in our conversation and adding this as an option. Um, when you're talking with folks who might be have housing insecurity, I think one would be great to know for, I, I'm guessing Ernesto, but correct me if I get that wrong, um, that would be for folks who might own their own homes and like could use help to share their mortgage costs by subletting out. I think some of that's one figuring out if you have any organizations in your community, even outside your usual suspects, who are doing that. Um, like I know that there are some, I live in San Diego County, there are groups who do that specifically for lower income seniors and help to navigate that. So one, like are somebody doing this and we're just not connected to it because it's not specifically in the homelessness space. Um, you also can do some sort of external messaging to folks, have things available on your website, folks do different information sessions. So I think what's the way that people meet and talk in your community and use that as initial challenges to, or uh, channels to get the word out there. Uh, so I see there are more questions. So let me jump down to panelist question. Do these leases need to be one year? Can they be month to month? So COC does require that the leases are 12 months and uh, ESG is silent on that. So it can be month to month. I would say like, I always advocate that we go for the path that provides people with the most housing stability, which can be one year. Um, but I mean, I, it really depends on your funding source in that respect. So if you're doing shared housing and it's month to month, you can make that work. And um, I don't know, Chris, you're probably on the line. If you want to chime in with anything different on that, feel free. But that's more guided by your funding sources than like the shared housing um, solution. And then I see Ernesto asked where we could share um, the session where HUD frequently asked questions. I threw that in the chat. I will put it in again right now, Ernesto, so you can see it. Um, and it's uh, this link here, but if you ever just need to find it, you can look for the SNAP's office hours on the HUD exchange, and it's connected to their um, disease and control websites, but it's right there. It was the May 13th office hours. Um, so feel free to click that link. It gives you a recording and the slides, but I would say the content is in the actual recording. Um, the slides themselves were very, I would say fairly high level. So I would recommend that you check that out. Um, how do organizations determine how to split the rent between households? So there's a rent calculation, um, Madeline, that comes down to 
how much space folks have, the square footage of their room and other shared living spaces. I can do, I don't have it at my fingertips right now, but I could do some digging on some rent calculations for you and share that out. Cause then it's not, uh, it's really a, a pragmatic question. It's not like, oh, I wanna share this much versus that much. It's versus like how much living space is yours privately versus someone else's. Um, you could, if you roll in utilities that adds in a different discussion, but that's really what it comes down to more than anything is like square footage and uh, those types of things. Um, can you share examples of the four types of agreements for shared housing? Sure, I could share an example for sure of what a roommate agreement could look like. I might have to do some digging and share it with our ICF friends after this call. Um, the lease agreement is the lease agreement. Um, so if you need an example of what that looks like in a roommate situation, I could see what I could find. Often um, owners and managers have their preferred style that they want, they want to use. So you might just kind of like ask them to create two different leases for a home. And then the other agreements are ideally ones that are already in your program where you indicate like how you can expect rental assistance um, and then like what you communicate with the tenant. So I can look to see if there are examples that would be beneficial to you. But Madeline, I see you have your hand up. So I believe you're allowed to come off mute. Hi, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify, I should have said three of the four because the lease, obviously the, the landlord will have their lease. Um, but uh, I'm interested in starting this kind of program and um, housing services in general are very, very new to my county. So um, just like if you had an example, like if there is an example of an agreement that the third party had with the landlord or yep. the roommate agreement or um, those documents or or like a policies and procedures document for shared housing. Any yeah. of those that could be shared would be really helpful for us. Absolutely. Madeline, I'm going to throw into the chat. It's from the Shared Housing Institute and it's a guide that they put together. If when you click on that link, there's a few different things hyperlink there. And one is, you know, client messaging process. So that also gets to the question earlier of like, how do we talk with folks about this? But there's also on here, like a housemate pairing process. Um, they call it a housemate pairing questions. They use housemate over roommate because most folks aren't living in a room together. It's semantics, but just so that you're aware. Um, they talk about like conflict resolution, other things. And that's also where there's a training on the HUD rules and regs. So I would encourage you to start there for that roommate or housemate agreement. Um, there are other examples that I could pull out if that doesn't meet your need. Um, and then you could look under if you at the very top, it says like home about us and then SH tools for shared housing tools. There's a bottom one called how to find and keep a housemate that I think hyperlinks to some of the ones on that link I sent you. Um, but just things that you can use as you start to build out your program. And would would that website have an example of of the provider's agreement with the landlord? It doesn't. So I will look through some of my files and I'll pull that. Um, I don't have anything at my fingertips right now. If anyone else on the call does and they want to like throw that in the chat, great. Um, I just don't want to make you all like sit here while I search for it in my files. Thank you. Yep. And I should also say, like, this is like a, a plug for the future. We're doing a specific shared housing training in early 2023, where we're going to go into a bit more details. Like, this is very much a teaser conversation, but um, encourage you if there are folks who are either interested or are currently doing this and want to start building like a peer network who are, is involved in shared housing, please join us. And we can, um, if you have questions that lead up, make sure you're grant administrators and specialists know we could factor that in so the training is based off of what you need in the community. Is there anyone else that has any more questions? One thing that I think, um, Erica, that um, that you covered that some people may uh, be wondering about as well is we often know that organizations have limited staff. Mm. So 
Are there any pointers that you can give to organizations when um, that may help them incorporate some of the shared housing staff roles with current roles? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think this can go back, like if you are a case manager or whatever the title is, but you're kind of like a one person shop, you do it all from start to finish. I, this kind of comes back to just asking the questions, like, would you be willing to consider this? Or, you know, you want to live in this area, two bedrooms cost this much, you split the cost and just seeing if, if your um, clients that you're working with are interested in it and start small. Um, and if they are, then that could open the doors to if they know anybody in their own network, or if you have other folks that you're working with at your agency or other organizations that you can match with them. But I think some of it's just initially starting to ask the question and see how that goes. And if they're, you're starting to see interest, um, I would just recommend that, like recognize that that's a great option. And that could be a space then for you to have broader conversations through your continuum of care. So then it doesn't just fall on one person, but you're thinking about it in other places, maybe case conferencing or your by nameless meetings or what have you. Thank you. So we don't want to rush out, but if no one else has any more questions or anything, I want to thank Shivana for moderating today and doing a great job. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. And of course, thank you, Eric, Erica, for this session on shared housing. Um, much needed information. Please remember that the slides and I'll, Erica, I'll wait for you to get those couple of documents um, to go out. But the slides and documents from today will go out within the next couple of days. Remember that a quick survey will come up whenever you log out of today's session. If you haven't signed up for future office hours, please make sure that you do. And you all have a great day and we'll see you next week. Thanks.